of, of energy demand. So whether it's higher or lower than what we're projecting has a very large impact on what uh, energy consumption is. Um, for example, in China, over the last decade, we've seen double-digit uh, double uh, growth in our economy, where we're going to see that um, we're anticipating that slowing through the projection period, and how whether it truly d decelerates as much as we're anticipating will have a very large impact on the ultimate energy consumed um, in the world. Uh, we also have uncertainties related to the near term. Um, in particular, we have the uncertainty of how U.S. tight oil production may um, may react to the current low oil price environment. Although we are seeing declining rig counts, um, and less capital in, in investing within uh, tight oil production in the United States, uh, we're not really seeing a steep decline just yet. But over the long term, even just uh, even though we're expecting oil prices to rebound uh, in the next decade, uh, what, what will the impact be? Um, then we, of course, have geopolitical risk, the continued uh, risk of unrest in the Mideast and North Africa. Right now, we have about 3 million barrels per day uh, offline of crude production, liquids production. Uh, so what will that be in the future? We have what, ha what will happen when Iran reenters the world oil market. And so the list basically goes on. So, uh, looking at our global outlook, this is basically this graph is basically the key to all the findings I am going to be showing you in this presentation. It's uh, somewhat of a chi identity uh, type of graph, um, but really between the uncertainty slides and this slide, this is this really kind of frames the whole discussion within the IEO. So this graph shows the major drivers of world energy demand. Um, and this includes economic activity and population growth, which could influence um, increases in energy use. And pulling in the opposite direction are improvements in the energy use uh, per unit of economic output. So this is the energy intensity. And this is a result of uh, efficiency improvements, as well as structural shifts in the economy. So for all the drivers, you can see there's differences among the key countries and regions. Of note, um, in terms of economic prosperity, you can see China and Indi India uh, is ri rising faster um, in terms of their GDP per capita uh, than their energy intensity falls. Um, so that will have a very large impact on international energy markets um, for the next uh, several decades. There's also significant population growth uh, that we're projecting in the Middle East and Africa, um, where we have declines in Russia and Japan. Um, you can see that the per capita economic output uh, grows as similar relates in the mature economies of um, the United States and OECD Europe. Um, and they're about 1.5, 1.7% 1 per year. And this is only about 40% of the projected growth rate we're seeing in China and India. So just taking a look at um, energy use by fuel. Uh, use of all fuels growth grows throughout the production period. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, renewables is the fastest growing uh, fuel uh, within our projection. One of the things that you'll notice, um, I'm presenting results from our reference case, uh, which is uh, current laws and regulations. Um, it, at the time that we were modeling this, um, the CPP had not been finalized. So um, the dotted line for the US Clean Power Plan um, includes some of the findings uh, from a previous analysis EIA did on the Clean Power Plan's implementation. So the Clean Power Plan would lower coal use um, and increase renewable use. Um, Oil uh, does, as I mentioned earlier, does remain the largest source of energy, but its share falls from about a third to 30%. Um, on a worldwide basis, uh, this liquids, uh, growth in liquids consumption primarily comes from the transportation and industrial sectors. There's been, there are strong policy incentives for renewables, which is uh, supporting the growth in, in that, those fuels. 
So in terms of end use, um, similar, similar to what we've seen in the past, um, despite the growth in, in energy overall, um, the end use, um, the shares by end users are basically the same with industrial consuming over 50% of the world's energy. One of the things that we look at is the correlation between electricity and GDP growth, which is typically highly correlated. Um, in IO 2016, uh, reference case projections, we, we uh, expect economic activity will continue to drive electricity demand, but just not quite at the level it has in the past. Um, so for example, from 2005 through 2012, uh, the world's GDP increased by 3.7% per year where the world net electricity generation rose by 3.2% per year. Um, in many parts of the world, there's policy actions to um, support efficiency measures. Uh, and that has helped to couple uh, the economic growth from the growth in, in electricity. So uh, in this IEO over the projection period, we have GDP growth um, being 3.3% for the world and electricity uh, growth at only 1.9%. So again, if you look back into recent history, we had uh, GDP growing at 3.7 and electricity closely behind at 3.2. Uh, going forward, we're seeing growth at 3.3% and uh, electricity growth at 1.9. So if we had held this, this same relationship going forward, clearly electricity consumption would be much higher. So non-OECD nations uh, drive the increase in total energy use. So if you go back to that first uh, graph that I showed you where you saw the increase of GDP per capita and the decreasing energy intensity, um, this is a, within the OECD nations. This is a kind of a logical outcome. Um, Non-OECD accounts for 84% of the world's increase in energy uh, consumption over the 2012 through 2040 period when it rises by about 71%. And this is compared to OECD energy uh, consumption, which increases only 18% over that same time period. So most of this is coming from non-OECD Asia, um, which uh, accounts for over 50% of the increase in world energy use. Um, in 2012, non-OECD Asia accounted for nearly one-third of the, to the total world energy consumption. But with this strong e economic growth, we're seeing a near doubling by 2040 uh, in uh, non-OECD Asia energy growth. And in fact, non-OECD Asia um, energy consumption surpasses all OECD nations by the year 2030. So again, this is just in non-OECD Asia surpassing OECD in 2030. We see a decline in carbon intensity um, in both the non-OECD and OECD, and par this is part partly owing uh, to the shift towards less carbon intensive fuels, um, such as the growth in natural gas, as well as uh, different countries uh, such as China moving to more of a service um, economy from an industrial economy. Um, you can see uh, What's circled in gray in, in the history, there was actually an increase in uh, carbon intensity in non-OECD um, from the 2000 to 2010 type of period. And this is with the uh, advances in industrial, industrialization and urbanization um, in certain economies uh, in the non-OECD. So just taking a look at liquid fuels. We have a uh, world use of petroleum and other liquids growing from 90 million barrels per day in 2012 uh, to 121 million barrels per day in 2040. Uh, most of the growth in liquid fuels consumption is in the industrial and transportation sectors, um, primarily in the transportation sectors, which accounts for 62% of the total growth. Um, we do see some non-liquids use um, in the transportation set sector such as natural gas and electricity and hybrids but uh, liquids continues to be the dominant fuel for that um, outside the transportation sector uh, we do have growth in the industrial sector as well which uses liquids as a feedstock non-oecd regions account for essentially all the growth 
that we're seeing in liquid fuels um, in the IAO 2016 re reference case, and in particular, um, consumption from Asia and the Middle East accounts for about 75% of this increase in liquid fuel. And part of this is um, owing to the growth in uh, transportation and, and passenger miles. So that what this, what this shows you is with the growth in GDP, how does um, passenger miles correlate with that? You can see that the OECD regions for the most part are um, much more economically developed uh, by definition and thus have higher levels of personal mobility. But even given that, you can see in China and India and other non-OECD Asia that this is growing. So transportation is um, and passenger miles are growing in those regions. In terms of where this is, um, the increased liquids uh, consumption is going to be supplied from, we see OPEC still serving an essential role in um, supplying uh, this, this increment of, of growth. Um, it contributes more than half of the increment that's needed to satisfy the increased consumption. So for OPEC, it grows by 13 million barrels per day. Um, and this is compared to non-OPEC sources, which grow by 10.1 million barrels per day. In terms of other liquids, these are the components of other liquids. Um, in large part, as you can see, NG, it's dominated by NGPLs, natural gas plant liquids. And a lot of this is um, because of the levels of natural gas production. Um, and this is a co-product with that. Uh, in terms of some of these uh, coal to liquids and gas to liquids, as well as biofuels, um, there is going to be an effect with the current low price environment, since these are very capital intensive type of um, you know, type of industries, uh, um, that the investment in this current low oil price environment is not being made um, in terms of uh, building coal to liquid and uh, gas to liquid facilities, uh, which may um, reduce uh, the share that they'll contribute. Looking at natural gas, um, <clears throat> similar to what we've seen, the strongest growth, and uh, it, it's true for natural gas as well, the strongest growth in natural gas consumption is projected for countries in the non-OECD Asia. Uh, that said, consumption of natural gra gas grows in every IO region. Um, for non-OECD regions, it grows an average of about 2.5% per year, and this is in contrast to in OECD uh, areas where it grows about 1.1%. Non-OECD countries account for 76% uh, percent of the increase in natural gas consumed. In terms of where it's going to be coming from, uh, we see a large growth in uh, production from China, and this is primarily from their shale resources. We also have uh, continued growth in the United States production of natural gas, as well as uh, growth in Russia. And the Russian natural gas production growth is primarily from the Arctic areas, as well as the Eastern regions. Uh, China, the United States, and Russia accounts for 44% of the overall increase in natural gas production. Um, although the world's uh, shale and tight resources, uh, what was formerly known as un unconventional resources, are largely untested. We do see some uh, strong commercial levels of production um, in these resources coming from China and Canada within our projections. Um, for China and Canada, their, their uh, production from these, uh, these tighter resources are going to contribute about 80% of their overall uh, domestic natural gas productions. Uh, in the United, United States right now, uh, sh shale gas uh, provides for about 50% of total production. So moving on to electricity, this is just showing you uh, the graph by region that I showed you earlier about the relationship to GDP um, and electricity. And you can see just in the non-OECD um, grouping that we, they had a rapid rise of electricity growth and GDP growth with the growth in industrialization as well as urbanization. And we expect that to um, decline even further than what we're seeing in uh, the more mature economies of the OECD. So in terms of what we're seeing, um, the electricity being generated, 
by fuels. Um, we're seeing growth in uh, natural gas as well as renewables, and this uh, it takes away some of the share that coal has had. Coal um, has typically, since the late 80s, produced about 37 to 40 percent of the world's electricity generation, and that falls to 30 percent by 2040. And so uh, natural gas, coal, and renewables, and we do include hydropower as a renewable at EIA, large hydropower, roughly have the equal share by, the, by 2040. Um, in terms of non-hydropower renewables, we're sh showing the largest growth coming from solar um, with a growth rate of 8.3% per year. Hydropower, though, um, in, in some areas of, of the world um, still grows. This is largely in uh, the developing nations. In terms of nuclear power, uh, most of the growth in nuclear power is coming from China, where they put on 139, um, they install 139 gigawatts of new nuclear capacity. Um, in, in terms of the OECD, um, only in Korea do we see um, growth in nuclear capacity where it grows. Um, they, they're adding about 15 gigawatts of capacity, but um, decreases in uh, nuclear capacity in Canada as well as OECD Europe. Um, nets an overall reduction in nuclear capacity um, for the OECD. So just quickly taking a look at um, energy-related emissions. Um, they are increasing, and as I mentioned earlier, they're increasing by about a third from tw uh, 2040 or 2012 to 2040. Uh, one of the things to note is just really the the, the shares um, over time have shifted um, between what's contributing to uh, energy-related carbon dioxide emissions, where in 1990. Uh, the share of liquid fuels emissions uh, made up about 43% of total emissions. And then by 2012, that was the share coal had. And we're seeing um, that decline, um, with, um, particularly with the increase in emissions from natural gas with, due to the increased use of natural gas. Just taking a look at coal, um, China, the United States, and India account for um, over 70% of the world's coal consumption. Over our projection period, we're only seeing growth um, continued in India of coal. We have um, China's uh, growth uh, plateauing in the mid 2020s. Um, and as you would expect, just um, with the growth in energy con consumed in, in non OECD Asia, it accounts for 60% of the increase in the world's um, energy related CO2 emissions, particularly as they rely. Uh, more heavily on fossil fuels um, than the rest of the world. And so that is my presentation. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that we've gotten with uh, our IEO because of the timing of the release and the timing of our modeling is how does it reflect the INDCs related to Paris? Um, and how, how have we modeled them? And how have we incorporated them? Um, and where there was actually policies in place with these INDCs, they are, have been incorporated already within our projections. So, for example, China had um, China is only two percent of the INDCs that were submitted um, had uh, peaking what they call peaking requirements. We're going to peak by a certain year, and we're going to hold our admissions at that level. China was one of those countries that um, so only two percent of the INDCs had them. Unfortunately, one of the largest countries had um, had it, um, and so ha we took very carefully looked at, you know, what what is chi China's energy related emissions levels in 2030, and, and how could we, um, you know, what would need to be done to hold them there. Um, what we felt was reasonable for a reference case is we do have um, their emissions growing through 2030, and but the growth significantly is smaller after 2030, from the 2030 to 2040 time period. So there is some reflection uh, with, in that scenario, or in a reference case. Uh, additionally, some of the INDCs had um, land use requirements. Um, 
This includes uh, Brazil um, and Canada. So this is, you know, they're going to combat carbon emissions and emissions in general um, with how they use land. And that's something that we don't necessarily model in, in um, or have within our uh, energy related CO2 emissions. Um, interestingly, the UN did put out a report where they produced uh, what they we're assuming uh, different emission levels would be for these different countries based upon their INDCs. Um, and for some, some of the countries, such as Brazil and Canada, uh, we actually came uh, very close to in terms of how, we, how we're reflecting the emissions um, within the IEO. So I'm sure that might not be a very satisfying answer since we don't have a specific um, international. Internationally, we do have some site case scenarios. We have a high and low oil price um, scenario for the IEO. And we also have a high and low macro, but we don't have the full, in our domestic um, outlook, we have a full suite of extended policy cases and, and just different things. Um. But just to understand, so when you model a particular country, say the United States, you're gonna model the clean power plan, the fuel economy standards, you're not modeling 26 to 28% reduction the INDC commitment, you're modeling policies that, is, that you can identify. That is correct. We model policies, specific policies. And that was an, that's another challenge um, with where some of these INDCs are right now. I, I believe they said 96% uh, of the countries um, have that contribute 99% of the emissions have submitted these INDCs, but uh, many of those countries have yet to but place a gap between the policies, how they're going to get there. Um, there's also some very gray areas. If, for example, if you look at Mexico, Mexico's INDC reflects a change of, from baseline for a business as, us, as usual, but they don't really, did, they don't really um, spell out, well, what is that business as usual case? And so where, when they're, going, they're reducing from a certain level in the next decade, well, what, what are they anticipating that level to be? So. Uh, so, and let's just sort of talk about each of the different fuels for a couple of minutes. So you show, I mean, there's, um, a lot of talk, coal has obviously faced a lot of headwinds in the U.S. The coal industry is not doing well. Um, speculation that maybe we've seen peak coal demand, uh, Chinese coal demand declined, I think, slightly last year. You show it, I think, growing a little bit more, but basically plateauing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so what's the outlook for coal? I mean, coal is sort of often you hear rhetoric that coal is on its way out. Coal is a dying fuel. But when you look around the world. Uh, it is a big shift to stop growing at those rates, but is it accurate to say you still think where we're headed now, coal is playing a really big role for a really long time, uh, absent those kind of additional policy measures that you just talked about? Yes, I mean, coal within our outlook is still the, the uh, I believe, the third largest fuel, third largest contributor to, to energy consumption. Um, we have coal growing by, I believe it's like 0.6% um, throughout per year throughout the outlook. Um, we do see really the main growth area or what's driving a lot of the growth is, is use in India, where they are um, using it both for their industry, um, their steel industry, and their, they um, import in all their cooking coal, they don't produce it, um, as well as for their electric sector. Um, there has been some constraints uh, infrastructure-wise within India even to get, um, I know, They've had some problems, I believe, last year, even just moving the coal to where it needs to be because of um, issues with the rail lines. Um, so there are things keeping keeping back their full potential of coal use, um, but we do see it growing. And India. can you um, talk what the, that sharp increase in coal and then basically plateauing? The biggest drivers of that change was it policy driven by climate or air quality? Was it the structural changes in the Chinese economy, something else? I think for, for China in particular, it's it's a combination, but definitely policy has played played a role within that. And and with with their INDC committing themselves to a, a 20, uh, I think it was like mid-20s level of coal consumption um, through through the, the future. Um, that definitely has is a driver, but there, that combined with the fact there is a structural shift in their economy as they're moving towards more of a ser service-oriented economy. That's also supporting, not plateau, but policy is definitely um, one of the key drivers with that. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Modi was here. There were um, really um, uh, promising uh, discussions with the U.S. administration about INDCs, about the growth of renewables, very aggressive renewable targets in India. But, but in terms of total Indian energy consumption and CO2, you showed coal increasing at pretty rapid rates. 
much smaller total numbers than China, but pretty strong growth rates. Is that right? Yes, that, that is true. Although I do believe, and I don't, I don't have my, my IEO tables with me, but I do believe we have um, growth as well in renewables uh, within, the, in, within India as well. I think India, India within our uh, projections uh, for GDP has a 5.5% per year um, increase in GDP. It's the strongest, has the strongest growth um, out of all the countries and regions uh, within our projections. So in order to support that growth, and support the the energy consumption growth and energy consumption that comes with that, um, th you know they're they are expanding coal, but they are also uh, targeting gas and renewables and other less carbon intensive fuels. And can you say a little more about that link between economic growth and energy demand? I mean, there's been talk of decoupling. These could be not. I mean, we we've seen them in some sense decouple for decades now, right? The energy intensity of the economy has gone down. We use less energy per unit of GDP, but is that uh, is that is that going to increase in the future even further? The de the decoupling. Yeah, the, the 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 connection between the impact that economic GDP that GDP growth has on energy yeah. demand. That's I think we we are definitely um, seeing uh, yeah the strength in the decoupling, and you can even even in some of the graphs that I showed where you saw GDP in electricity, not total energy, you could see that decoupling um, strengthening, um, particularly as some, some of the more industrialized countries, such as China, move towards this service-oriented um, type of economy. But then, you know, you have, you know, in India, more of an industrialization um, occurring there as well. So it's kind of just shifting. I, mean, I just want to be clear. I have I always have like a little pet peeve with this word decoupling. I mean, they're still strongly connected. They are still very it, strongly it, connected. It's just that the energy intensity of GDP growth in the future will continue to be less than it's been in yes. the past. And, this, and, and a lar some of that is also just a large drive for energy efficiency as well. Right. Um, and one of the things I assume that would drive coal demand too would also be the cost of substitutes. So can you, uh, how the natural gas world is changing. We're going to see over the next five years, people are talking about a glut of gas, the U.S. and Australia putting huge amounts of LNG into the global market. Um, we $18, $20 natural gas prices in Asia that are now down below five. Uh, that affects um, the cost of gas as a substitute fuel. What's the outlook in your view for the global gas market, global gas prices, and the effect that has on demand for other fuels like coal and renewables? So um, through 2019, uh, EIA is anticipating about a 30% increase in the world's LNG capacity, and this is primarily from projects coming on from the United States and Australia, um, and that is feeding into the glut that you're referring to, and plus then we have the slowing of, slowing of the growth in economies in Asia that's weakening demand. and. We have, um, you know, J Japanese some nuclear capacity returning in Japan, which is also um, reducing the demand for natural gas um, for that country. Um, we do see the the markets rebalancing um, in the mid 2020s. Um, in terms of prices, uh, we don't anticipate um, at this point uh, a within the, within the production period uh, one like a global gas price. So right now we still have very distinct regional markets for gas. So even though the, the, the prices are closer together, like as you refer to that price in Asia, which was typically $18 and was an, an, very much an economic incentive for a lot of LNG pro projects um, in this country um, be, being low, but that's just largely because of oil prices, I mean, clearly because oil prices are very low combined with this additional liquefaction capacity coming online. Um, but we do see um, you know, through, through the mid 2020s, uh, growth in consumption, we see increasing use of um, floating gas in, uh, in storage units um, for for uh, countries that uh, have swing demand or or don't want to invest in a complete regasification unit. We see um, you know there's growth in, in that technology. Um, we and again we see growth in uh, natural gas being consumed for electricity around the world. So we do feel that there is going to be um, enough demand to support the capacity. And with this increased liquidity in the global gas market and increased gas trade, do you, and you've studied the gas market for a long time, do you see the price of gas in Asia being still set by the price of oil for a long time or based on supply and demand for gas as a commodity? It will increasingly, yeah, it will increasingly be um, delinked from oil. Um, so the, the way that EIA looks at 
considers it or in we, how we consider it in our models as well, particularly when we're um, deciding, you know, what, what type of, type of uh, capacity we should be building domestically, like within the annual energy outlook. Um, we feel that the, yeah, there's a certain degree of linkage between oil prices and, and, um, in Asian markets as well as in somewhat in European markets, but as more and more of what we consider flexible volumes of LNG come online, so these are um, flexible volumes largely are coming from the United States because of the, the gas, uh, gas price linkage with them, that the oil price, the linkage starts to de decrease. But we never have a complete collapse like within our model of um, the oil price linkage within in, in Asia. Uh, the, uh, the head of the IEA, Fatih Bro, a couple of days ago, I think, uh, made some comment about how, you know, five years ago they did the study of the golden age of gas with a question mark, golden age of gas. Uh, and then he, I think, was quoted as saying the golden age of gas had stalled. That, you know, what was seen as potentially a bridge fuel, a transition fuel that support for climate policies and other things could boost demand for gas, we weren't seeing. So is the, is the golden age of gas, uh, has it stalled? Is it, is it over? Or what's the outlook for gas? And what are the key drivers of that? Technology, policy choices like we've seen in, in Europe or elsewhere? Yeah, I don't, you know, whether it's the golden age of gas <laughs> or, the, or, you know, or if it's the, uh, the, the, we should be writing the obituary for the golden age of gas. I mean, we see gas consumption growing. Um, through d both domestically, uh, you know, within our annual energy outlook, as well as um, internationally. And we see that because it is, for many economies, a cleaner fuel, cleaner option of fuel. Uh, for, so it's policy driven. And then we, we also have, um, particularly in the United States, with our, um, how productive our resource is and how much gas we can get out of the ground for the, at, at what price we can get it out, out of the, the ground at. Um, so like one thing I will say is our, our IO 2016, the, fa the foundational domestic for the U.S. Um, projections within that came from the annual energy outlook 2015, right? Because we, we model on a lag and that was what was available and published. So recently we produced our annual energy outlook 2016. Um, we released the reference case, which includes a clean power plan and a no clean power plan case. And we're, we're going to be rolling out different cases um, all this month. I think we're releasing more clean power plan cases since there's several ways to uh, adopt that um, this week. And then we have extended policies. We have a phase two on, on, on vehicles. There's a lot of different cases. But one of the most striking things, I think, about the annual energy outlook this year is if you look at natural gas and the production of natural gas, Henry Hub prices um, over the projection period don't rise over four dollars and fifty cents, which is a huge change from what we what we've had before. Um, and since we're a number one producer of gas in the world, I mean that does have a cascading effect. So in terms of the golden age of gas, I mean we're, I, I mean EIA being policy neutral, we usually don't like to deem anything as a gold, golden age or anything, but we're certainly, you know, seeing continued growth in gas um, and, and with continued low prices. Does the world want U.S. gas anymore? I, well, and with, I would, I think so. I, I mean, there is I mean, growth. you said the price, in eight, you know, from 18 down to five or below. So is that, given how the market has changed, yeah. is there still a market for U.S. exports? I think I, I, we're seeing a market for U.S. exports, and, and in fact, if in, within our annual energy outlook, the recently released annual energy outlook, we're seeing significantly higher levels of LNG exports um, compared to our previous AEOs um, through like the mid mid twenties to late twenties. There's a definite because of up. a lower projected price for domestic supply, a higher price for it's global a, spot markets. It's driven by the lower domestic. Uh, supply price, but even with the lower, but it's still economic to export even with the lower um, international prices. Okay. Uh, the um, you also showed you know pretty sustained strong growth in oil demand for a long time. Um, Three hundred thousand pre-orders for the Tesla. There's a lot of excitement about the extent to which electric vehicles could reach a tipping point. Um, 
what's your view of, of alternatives to oil? How uncertain is that outlook for, for oil demand uh, that you have in there? And then just more broadly, you know, when you do these projections, how do you, I mean, EIA gets criticized sometimes, right? We know the projection is going to be wrong, but that's fine. They're all wrong. But, but the question is, uh, the, they get criticized for sort of, you know, how do you think about the potential for technology and innovation uh, in the sort that we can't really always see today? How, how do you think about that when you see these things taking off, like uh, the potential for electric vehicles to, to sharply, uh, sharply grow? So one of the... One of the new things that we have in this IEO 2016, so EIA is making a real push of expanding our international modeling capabilities, and that's actually one of the reasons why we didn't uh, or we were late in producing this IEO because um, we were hoping to get it out by December. Is um, one of the driving factors is we have a new international transportation model, um, which has is much more detailed than what we've done had in the past. Um, but I, and as you said, all all models are no <laughs> models perfect, um, and all uh, pr projections are going to be wrong. But we're seeing liquids continue to dominate um, in in heavy duty trucking, um, in in uh, light duty vehicles. Um, we do see some alternative um, Tesla, or it's my understanding um, that for electric vehicles, we aren't seeing them gaining a huge market share. Um, we do have, for some uses, uh, alternative energy, such as like natural gas. Uh, in, by 2040, within our um, projections, 50% of bus fleets are fueled by natural gas. So we do see some, some alternatives to liquids, but uh, liquids still are the primary um, fuel of choice for transportation within, within our projections, within our models. In terms of how we view um, you know, technology, um, Usually we don't, in our reference cases, we don't necessarily have disruptive, we don't anticipate disruptive technology. So something really big is gonna happen in 2026. Just wait for it, you know, and it's gonna change everything. Like we don't, don't really look at that, but we do consider, you know, we evaluate current technology and the growth of, of current technology. So, so like the Tesla question, you know, is that, okay, they have all these orders, you know, what, what are the likelihood, what, what are the, economics um, for actually getting large-scale adoption around the world of an electric vehicle. Um, so it, it is something that we do consider, but it, within that consideration, we still found liquids to be the ideal, trans or the optimal uh, transportation fuel within our model. One of those disruptive technologies was, was shale, right? And, yes. and that was not just in the EIA, but lots of people didn't see the full potential coming. I'm just curious, the international energy outlook outside the U.S., uh, what do you think the outlook is for shale uh, outside North America, and is it going to lead to the same sort of supply revolution we've seen here in the U.S.? Um, we, I mean, we see, so EIA has, along with ARI, um, which is a contractor, has shale assessments and assessments of different shale basins around the world. Um, so there definitely is resources around the world, uh, clearly. In terms of the commercial um, us seeing what is going to be commercially produced. Um, you know, we're considering Argentina ha has, a, you know, an attractive looking shell and we do see some levels of production occurring there. Um, but really, I, I would say the major non-U.S. or non-North America shell pr or type production is coming from China within our um, projection. So. Right now in China, in the, there's a formation called the Long, Long Maxi in the Sichuan province, province and um, they have been drilling wells there and getting some production um, from those wells. And we're seeing within our projections that this um, that it is a productive resource. Whether people can match the success we've had in the United States, there's a lot of issues and a lot of factors beyond the resource. I mean, clearly the resource is a huge factor. And, and, and with these shale resources, even though they're all classified, say, as shale, they're, they can be very distinctly different. But there's also above the ground factors. Um, there's the community support. Um, there's royalties, um, which is a huge, and, and you know, mineral rights 
which are, which is huge in the United States for supporting this. Um, there's just even just the experience and know-how that we have in the United States um, because of the supportive business environment, the fact we've been doing this for decades, um, that supports you know the level of production we're seeing compared to elsewhere in the world. And I, so I know, understand you know the the role EIA plays modeling current policy, not ambition like two degrees modeling you know not and not modeling as a reference case disruptive sort of technologies. But I'm just wondering in your own mind. If this turns out to be wrong 20 years from now, uh, what do you think are the most likely reasons it's wrong? Like, what, what, what seems to you like the biggest uncertainties where there might be disruptive uh, tipping points? What seem like the most likely areas for that? Well, I think, I mean, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think a lot of that, I mean, I, and this isn't tech necessarily technology, I think a lot of where it could be wrong is in the GDP you know, our G GDP growth assumptions, because that is a huge driver in consumption. Um, there's certainly um, how, you know, there's how, how people, just different policy things, the policy related to nuclear, um, you know, a lot of European countries have, have announced or voiced, you know, that they're thinking of retiring some of their nuclear and whether th that type of policy happens. Um, the adherence of climate policies, that's a huge uncertainty. Um, so going, but the thinking like going out 20 years, where do I think, yeah, I think we might have got this wrong. Like I really don't have, it's really like a, in my mind, there's just a lot, there's so much uncertainty. It's fraught with uncertainty that I really couldn't target one one thing in particular. Um, that oil prices, I mean, what, who would have guessed you know, five years ago, what oil price environment would be in right now. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And where are we headed on the oil price? So within our, um, within the IEO projections, oil prices do rebound. Um, they get up to $80 within the next decade, and then they increase throughout the projection period to $140. I believe, and again, this is based on AEO 2015 oil prices, the cycle um, in AO 2016, our oil price, price path is lower. For, Are we um, setting ourselves up for another underinvestment cycle? I think the Financial Times today had the Woodmax study, you know, a trillion dollars in capital in the oil sector cutback, oil and gas sector cutback between now and 2020. Uh, so is the market going to, are we really tight in a couple of years when you look out? You have decent demand growth in, in your numbers. I mean, the, the potential is definitely there. I mean, we're not necessarily, um, seeing that within within our, our modeling. Um, but I mean, it certainly seems that in, within the energy industry, there are these cycles that happen, I mean, even, for, even with gas, like looking at gas and investment in gas infrastructure and then the, the lack of use within the, that infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, it's certainly possible. And I think I read, uh, we have Antoine Half here, our senior fellow who used to write the monthly oil market report at the IEA. So, you can tell me if I have this right, that um, his successor now uh, at the IEA, the, the idea of a call on OPEC may, may be sort of going away, that you sort of look at supply and demand in non-OPEC countries, you figure out the difference, and you assume OPEC will meet that, not that OPEC supply is determined always by fundamentals. So I'm just wondering how you see the potential changing role of OPEC, given what we've seen in their behavior over the last two years. And does that affect the way when you do the short-term energy outlook or these long-term outlooks, the way you're modeling and forecasting OPEC supply or thinking about the impact on price? I mean, we definitely, the, the modelers that, the liquids modelers definitely try to rationalize and consider what OPEC and what role OPEC will have in the future. Um, like in, for instance, one of one of the things that it, it seems um, that we're considering is the role that the OPEC countries want to maintain their share, whether that's a motivator, whether the short term, you know, in, in terms of why I haven't had supplies been cut back or why, you know, um, so that's something that um, we consider. Unfortunately, I probably don't have a really great answer for that. But. And the um uh, you talked, you showed the numbers, but just tell us again where you see 
the biggest growth in renewables, both within the renewable sector, the type of energy, and then also regionally, where the biggest growth is going to come from and what the drivers are. Again, are these rapidly declining costs? Is it policy drivers? Um, so we see a lot of growth in solar. Um, and I believe that the, in terms of I had a bonus slide in here <laughs> where I showed where the growth was coming from, it was. Um, Geographically, uh, in China is where we're seeing most of the growth. And a lot of that is policy driven because as they're replacing <coughs> their coal, um, coal generation with a more carbon neutral type of generation, including renewables. And the growth in nuclear is mostly in China too? It is, yeah. They have 139 gigawatts um, coming online within the projection. And when you model nuclear in the US, do you have to make an assumption about licensing renewables? What, what is that? The, renewals. Um, renew, sorry, renewals of uh, yeah, the licensing. We do. Um, we do make an assumption. I'm not. I'm not sure if we. I mean, we definitely have retirements capacity, but I think what I because I know one of the interesting things is um, in the next year's AEO and IEO, um, we're considering moving the projection period period out to 2050, and that will bump into a, some of these the, the licensing renewables renewing license renewal <coughs> issues uh with nuclear because of um, the expiration dates yeah 2040 always sounds so far away but 1990 doesn't sound like that long ago yeah <laughs> so but i think we're in the middle um so it's not that far uh okay so we have time for questions uh, do we have a microphone is that how we're doing questions uh does anyone know Is that okay? Um, yeah. Thanks. Hello. 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 Yeah. Thank you. If thank you could you. just introduce yourself and yeah, sure. keep the question brief. Thanks. Um, my name. My name is Miles. I'm a student at Columbia, and I am uh, interning here over the summer. Um, my question is, I've been following the uh, situation in Venezuela and the, you know, over the oil price declining. And one thing I've seemed to surmise from that situation is that um, it's not very easy to drop oil. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, what is the plan for uh, people who, like how, how, how is the, like you mentioned that the projected carbon intensity is going to decline over time. So how are institutional investors who are in charge of like pensions and entitlements, how are those funds going to shift over that over the next 20 years as, as far as your projections go and how, how are we going to what's the plan for like um, taking care of like the aging populations and oil dependent economies who are going to rely on the entitlements that oil previously brought and um, is that about just like shifting in terms of where we where we process natural resources and what kinds of natural resources we're processing what, what, what would those be and um, I wonder like how do you map that out so we don't, I mean, we do consider subsidies or these entitlements, as, as I guess as you refer to them, um, within certain economies when we're doing our mo modeling, but we don't necessarily take into account the impact of, on the population. Um, I know one of the things that we're considering um, or we're looking at right now, and this isn't necessarily for our, to feed into our models or our projections, is in particular, if you're considering Venezuela and the, the um, you know, the situation that they're in right now, um, they have a lot of relationships with neighboring con countries where, um, and how, how is this, you know, not, you know, how are neighboring countries, you know, paying back their debt to Venezuela uh, because they can, at a discounted level because Venezuela is interested in, in having the income and whether this in particular if you look at um, like some of the Caribbean countries were, which relied on Venezuelan oil for electric, electricity generation some of them are using the combination of um, even with the low oil prices both the low gas prices of an opportunity to shift into more of like natural gas um, fired uh, electricity plants. This is particularly happening in Jamaica and there's several other um, Caribbean countries that have had relationships with Venezuela. That, so I think a lot of times what we consider isn't 
necessarily the social aspect. I mean, we certainly do look at, you know, at the age of the population, when it, how, how it comes to energy use, et cetera, but we don't look at how oil prices or something will impact the, you know, the, the threat of society. Um, but these are, I mean, no, like the, these are a lot of countries that, there, obviously there are a lot of countries that depend heavily on oil revenue. And then when we talk about a transition uh, to lower carbon energy, the possibility that we'll see peak oil demand and it'll start to decline, that we'll move to a post-oil era. Some people speculate the Saudis are selling more now because they think it'll be worth less uh, in the future. We see oil and gas majors diversifying in some mm -hmm. cases, investing in renewable businesses or shifting uh, toward gas. So, but when I look at your numbers, then I'm like, well, you don't have to do any of those things. We're only using oil for a long time. Um, is that the right conclusion when someone looks at the international energy outlook or just sort of put the projections in the proper context when people think about the, the, the likelihood that we could see a real shift away from oil? Um, is the takeaway from this analysis that's pretty unlikely or just that given what we have in place today, current policies and not assuming sort of disruptive technologies, that's what the world looks like, but those things, you know, are, we really need to be thinking about those things. Well, I definitely think we should be considering all these things. I mean, we are the reference case is current policies, so we do have oil growing by I think 1.1 percent per year liquids, and and it is remaining the dominant fuel throughout our projection period. Um, and again, tying it back to transportation in particular, since that's the largest you know consuming sector of liquid fuels, as you have these developing economies growing in their GDP, and and there's higher levels of personal wealth or, and people are buying cars and they want to they have things and you know that we're seeing you know continued support for um, liquids consumption. So uh, just again for those watching online or, or listening to the podcast my name is Jason Bordoff I'm here with Angelina LaRose office director for the office of integrated and international energy analysis at the U.S. Energy Information Administration and we're discussing the IA's international uh, energy outlook. Um, let's go to the next question um, here in the aisle. Hi, Timothy Chung with Clearview Energy Partners. Uh, I think you mentioned that OPEC production is supposed to grow by, I think, 13 million barrels. <clears throat> Can you elaborate on where that's coming from? Is that even, evenly distributed or a couple of countries in particular? Uh, and kind of on Miles' point, um, how does E the IEO, uh, either in this one or perhaps future iterations, factor in things like Saudi Vision 2030. Uh, and they're uh, trying to get away from being an oil dependent economy. Thank you. Okay. So um, of the OPEC growth within the, within uh, the IEO is 70% of comes from the Middle East OPEC countries, as you would expect. Um, that we do not um, break out the particular countries um, in terms of where that growth is coming from. Um, in terms of how we factor in, like Saudi, Saudi's uh, 2020, uh, I mean, it, I'm not sure how we factored that into this IEO, but it is, we do, those are the, t when we look at policies, different announced policies from countries, um, we tend to look at the track record a country might have with keeping, you know, their their policy uh, pronouncements um, and adhering to them, um, and we also just take it into account what we think is is reasonable um, for for the country given certain limitations. So, for example, when we I, I mentioned about China having okay, yeah, they wanted wanted to have um, coal consumption peak at a cer certain certain time and. Uh, for emissions, you know, we we really evaluated that, and we did. We do have definitely an elbow in there where it slows and starts to plateau, but we don't. It's not necessarily strictly adhered to the, the policy pronouncement. Um, there was a question back here, and then we'll come up here. Yep. Thank you, John Malone of Amal Capital. In the um, can you speak to the assumptions that you're making in the forecast around deep water development? You know, in an $80 world, is that growing? Is that shrinking? What's happening? For deep water golf? Correct. Deep water in general, Brazil, Eastern Canada, 
anywhere. Is deep water development going to increase, decrease, or stay the same in an $80 world? You know, I'm not, I'm, I don't know the exact answer to that um, in terms of, I know, I know particularly when you look at um, offshore um, production, since those projects are multi-year projects, you do have some projects that have started and were, went down a path prior to the 80, prior to the $50 oil that we're seeing. Because even in, um, within our annual energy outlook um, for a, like offshore for the Gulf, um, we are seeing growth in Gulf of Mexico production. Um, I'm just not, I'm not quite sure if we're, if we're seeing that from deep water, um, but a, lo a lot of it is due to the lead time and the schedules of developing these projects. So it's our longer term. Antoine, do you have a view on the outlook for deep water? As long as you're in the room, you spent a lot and, of time. And, and he is also, a f I know you, <laughs> you introduced him as a former IEA, or he's also a former EIA. -er. That's true. So what, what, what do you want me to, what kind of pearl of wisdom do you want me to Let's, shed Well, uh, you, would say, you could say anything, but the, the question was specifically in a world of sort of 80-ish oil, what the outlook for offshore supply is around the world, whether it's Brazil or the Gulf of Mexico or elsewhere. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think you know it's a combination of uh, projects that have been invested in and sanctioned before the price started collapsing. So there's always a lag, and we see uh, uh, oil coming on stream you know, based on investments that were made sense at a higher price, even if that price is no longer uh, here. And then uh, looking forward, you're going to have very selective investments. You're going to have some. Uh, and we had some major projects approved last year, just about two, uh, but not zero. Uh, so we're going to have a few more. Um, and then I don't think the price is going to stay at 80, personally. So, um, you know, raise yourself for the next round of uh, high prices. So, and while you're holding the microphone, I mean, since you joined the Energy Center from the IEA and the EIA before that, uh, one of the major things you've been working on is is thinking about peak oil demand, thinking seriously about what the likelihood is, what the drivers would be, what the implications would be. So I'm just curious your reaction to kind of a projection that shows an ever-increasing straight line for oil. My reaction is it's great not to be at EIA and IEA anymore <laughs> <laughs> from that perspective, because when you're in those uh, institutions, you're constrained in terms of uh, the assumptions you can make. You have to you have to abide by policies that are in place. That's, a, that's the way the EIA works. Uh, you have some of the same constraints at the IEA. Uh, so one of the benefits we have at the place at Columbia is that we can, you know, uh, make more liberal use of our judgment and um, uh, not engage in scenario planning, but try to have educated guesses about what policies might be, actually. Uh, policies are, are not in place today, but that might be in place very soon. So um, <clears throat> based on that, I would imagine that the, I mean, I would be much more negative about the outlook for continued growth in, in oil consumption, uh, which does not mean that there's not going to be any need for oil investment and that getting that investment in place is not going to be a challenge. It might actually be a bigger challenge because of growing concerns about stranded assets and, uh, you know, anticipations that the energy transition will move away from oil and faster towards gas and renewables. Yeah, we'll be having an important input to that um, with a workshop in Beijing in a couple of weeks looking at, in detail at the outlook for Chinese oil demand. you have any reaction? Or? Well, I was going to ask Antoine a question since he's <laughs> <laughs> holding the mic. So I guess when, so when you're looking out, you know, over the next 15 years, I mean, I guess when do you see that, when, when would you anticipate oil consumption not growing? So <clears throat> I, I don't have the answer yet. Uh, okay. I have it soon. <laughs> I have it soon. No, we, we're engaging in a, in a fairly ambitious research agenda, uh, looking at this very issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Jason said, we have a, a, a round table in China at the end of this month, early next month, mm -hmm. uh, to look at the, this issue from the Chinese perspective. But we're also looking at, uh, at it from the perspective of India, from the perspective of policy changes uh, post Paris, uh, technology uh, improvements or, or breakthroughs. Um, so 
but I don't know. We, we're really open, open-minded about what the answer might be. And I think we have to be conscious as well that oftentimes we're tempted to extrapolate from recent trends. So if we look at the case of U.S. gasoline consumption, mm -hmm. uh, until about a year ago, uh, people were fairly convinced that it had peaked in, in 2007. And here we are after two years of low prices. We're mm -hmm. back at, uh, at records or even at higher levels that we reached uh, before. Uh, yeah. People thought the price has started pe uh, the, the consumption has started peaking, so I think we have to keep a very open mind. And uh, you know, there's a case to, to there's a fairly strong argument to, to be made for saying that uh, you know we're very close to peaking, but at the same time we could say that, you know we are still in, the, in a fairly weak period of economic growth. Um, Chinese consumption in the interior provinces is still very low compared to the coastal provinces. Indian demand is at a fraction of what Chinese demand is, which is itself a third of what U.S. demand is. So there's still, uh, you know, you could still be the case for, for very strong demand growth as well. Thank you. Um, there's a question up here, yeah. Thanks, Antoine. Uh, my name is Natasha Denzel, Columbia University. Before I go to my question, I actually want to add what Antoine said, because um, talking to students, I have to tell that students do not see, most of the students do not see their careers in oil and gas, and they more see they in the renewables. Uh, and I think it's telling something. And I, 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 I don't know when consumption will go down, but. I don't, I don't want to interrupt, but. Um, as somebody that used to work in the Office of Petroleum, Natural Gas, and Biofuels, we found it very hard to recruit <laughs> <laughs> students because I think they are, you know, they, everybody was more renewable. Right, focused. and it's not only in the U.S., it's like in Europe also. Yeah. Uh, my question actually is, uh, you mentioned that uh, LNG exports are feasible. And can you elaborate uh, where the, this efficiency is coming from? I know you said that you know low prices here, but let's say spot uh, market prices in Europe also very low. So is it like a business model, toll model, or efficiency in uh, transportation? Where the efficiency is coming from? Um, well, I think it, again, it's looking over looking over a longer period. So we have so within our outlook, we have. A more than doubling of LNG trade um, through to, uh, from 2012 to 2040 goes from 12 TCF to I believe 29 TCF, and I think it's um, largely from the in terms of the United States, it is because of the tolling arrangements. It's a flexibility um, within, so it's not having a fixed point destination. So it is being able to be a little more agile. Um, also, in the United States, if you look at the uh, increase in the market in South America, which with, so to transport, I mean, clearly it's a, it's a quicker transportation moving to, to gas to South America. And we do see increasing LNG um, imports within South America. In fact, um, we, we recently, in February, we had our first LNG exports of domestically sourced g gas from the lower 48. Um, and I believe the first cargo went to Brazil. Um, and, we're, and there's another uh, cargo heading down to South America, I think, that left this week. Um, so there's that expand, the expansion of that market. Um, but we do just, I think, a, a large part of it is driven by the contract structures, thinking of the U.S. in particular, since we are one of the main drivers of the growth in the market. The... the um, the contracts, the tolling agreements, and it, the fact it's based on a very low Henry Hub price. So even even I know like from history, Europe and Asia prices are very very low. But I think particularly looking out when the market gets a little tighter in the, like in the mid twenties. I think we have time for another maybe one or two questions. But uh, any other questions? I I not. Reminded me of something. So, if you don't yeah, mind, if sure. I if I take like an intermission and have a plug. Um, so, uh, we, EIA is having a conference um, in mid July, um, which is always a, a very uh, interesting event. Um, but we're also, um, for those of you who are interested in the EIA, we also are having a job fair along with that conference. So, um, where you can meet with people that are recruiting, not necessarily from the petroleum, natural gas, and biofuels team, <laughs> um, <laughs> although they are recruiting. Um, you know, and, and it, it'd be a good, it's a good opportunity if there's any, anybody here interested in working for the federal government or the EIA in particular to kind of meet with folks. So. Great. 
Okay. Uh, there were, I saw two hands, one up here. Let me go first here, and then there was one back there. Thank you. Uh, Sandeep Badwan from Continuum Associates. Angelina, I had a, um, I had a question on your growth rate for solar. So you had 8% global growth rate for solar until 2040. And uh, that sounds a little low compared to some of the things which we have observed in global markets. So for example, uh, just to throw out some numbers, China has grown at like 200% when it comes to solar. India over 250% when the markets opened up four or five years ago. The US alone is expected to grow 100% this year and has averaged between 70 to 80% over the past decade. So my question is, uh, and even if you look at some other trade media, it seems <clears> that solar is expected to grow exponentially fast. The marginal cost of production or the marginal cost of energy has come down significantly too in most areas. So just trying to understand why do you think, or why does the IEA think that the growth rates are gonna be fairly moderate at 8%? Um, so first, so that, again, that's eight percent per per annum over a twenty-eight year period. So, if, you know, in terms of a hundred percent growth rate, like if you're starting from one point to to an end point, you know, it is a, a significant amount of growth in solar. You know, if you're look, comparing twenty twelve to twenty forty, um, what we what we have in the IEO, or yeah, within within the IEO, I'm getting all my acronyms. I IEA IEO. <laughs> um, so you're saying a high percentage growth rate is a lot easier to do off a small base than a large. Yeah. Base. That is really like, I think that's one. So when you're, a lot of times when you're thinking of the U.S., oh, we grew 100%, you know, it's like, well, we grew 100% from a very small number. So if you're looking at the, like a, an annual growth rate of 8.3, um, not quite sure what our like beginning and ending, if you just took a, a simple average of that. Um, other than that, in terms of why we're not seeing, you know, because even with that growth rate, solar is still just a, a share of, of renewables, which by 2040 is only making up 30% of um, electricity generation. I think there's, uh, you know, with some of the reasons um, we have is just in terms of, um, you know, the, the cost of the, the technology compared to other technologies, um, the, the, and some of the other limitations um, with how it's being, how it can't, clearly can't be, there's no storage you know, it can't be used as, as a um, base load type of thing um, in most in most areas. So. I was looking uh, over the weekend at a set of government and academic studies from 1979-80 about what share of electricity or total energy solar would be by the year 2000. And the estimates range from 7 to 25 percent. <laughs> and I think now we're at one, a little less than one for total energy, not electricity. So. Yeah, it doesn't mean what's what the future will look like. But yeah. uh, anyway, there was a question in the back. Uh, thank you. Jack left uh, at Epfin. Um, so my question is probably about a problem that we don't have to worry about for a few years. But uh, one thing I was wondering is with if to reduce um, dependence on fossil fuels for transport, um, I guess that would involve, you know, increased fuel efficiency for cars or electric vehicles. Um, when you guys look at, you know, scenarios in which electric vehicles grow rapidly, um, does that, do you guys model in as well the pressure that would put on electricity generation in the sense that I, I think a lot of times when that discussion occurs, mm -hmm. it doesn't really incorporate the fact that we're still not providing most significant amounts of electricity by renewables? Um, we. I mean, we definitely look at it as an integrated, you know, our model's integrated, so we do take into account electricity. Um, and I mean, I guess somewhat relatedly maybe to what you're getting at, you know, so increased demand for electricity, depending on the source of the electricity, would, would feed into the carbon-related emission, energy emissions. Um, one of the things that I, I believe our model doesn't do that I know um, is something that Tesla and, uh, and other people that are really looking at electronic vehicles are considering. We are not looking at electronic vehicles as a uh, distributed batteries source to support the grid, where I know um, people have talked about electric cars being a, a very much of a two-way, kind of like a ability to peak shave uh, you know, while your, your car is plugged into the grid and you're not driving it. 
you know. Um, I, I do not believe that's something our model considers. Um, we should, um, I think later this summer, we are, since, since it seems that there is some interest in, transp in transportation or transportation um, projections com coming out, since as I mentioned, we have this new international transportation model called ITED. Um, since we have ITED, we are releasing, um, or we're, we're looking at the possibility of releasing a report of going over different transportation scenarios. So I think that might um, have, have some more of these answers um, that people might be interested in. Great, okay, well, um, I'm gonna thank all of you for being here, thank you for joining us. Thank uh, Angelina for being here. As I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. You can also subscribe to our podcast series on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, lots of other platforms, uh, two different podcast streams, one for the events we do like this, and then the other for Columbia Energy Exchange, which is our weekly 30-minute interview program with a senior energy leader uh, in the world. I think either this Monday or next Monday, then one of those episodes will be with Adam Sminsky, the director of the uh, Energy Information Administration. Um, and uh, please join us also for our next event, which will be Monday, June 20th at 9 a.m. here at the Columbia Club, where we will look at the International Energy Agency's medium-term gas market report. Uh, so um, thanks all of you for coming. Please join me in thanking again Angelina LaRose.